Open up your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28 this morning. How about somebody open us in prayer as we jump into God's Word? Genesis chapter 28, verse 1, says, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Paden Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty, bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. So Genesis 28 now. We've just finished last week the drama of Genesis chapter 27. Rebekah and Jacob, remember, had deceived Isaac into giving Jacob the blessing which the Lord had destined all along. And all that craziness on everyone's part is now over. And now we see, as Rebekah had planted the idea in Isaac's mind, to send him away to get a wife, away from the Canaanite women. And Rebekah really had an ulterior motive because she was concerned about the hatred that Esau had now developed for her, his brother, Jacob, as a result of all that drama in chapter 27. But as we always see in the Bible... God always works through all the craziness to bring about his will. Just as God is working through what all we see on the news today to bring about his will, which arguably is equally as crazy. It's difficult to see his hand in all the things that go on in our personal lives and in the affairs of our country and around the globe but we have a, a kind of a myopic, a myopic perspective because we can only see what's right around us and God has a, a perspective that's on a much grander scale. I think what's key is we look at verse 3 here. How does Isaac describe God to his son Jacob? He reveals to Jacob that their God is God Almighty. In Hebrew, it's El Shaddai. That's how God had revealed himself back to Abraham in chapter 17, when he established his covenant with him. I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. And now Isaac reveals who God is in that way to his son Jacob. What could Jacob possibly have to fear if he understood that? What could we possibly have to fear if we come to an understanding, come to grips with the fact that he is God Almighty? He's not just God, he's God Almighty. And the question I think we have to ask ourselves is, what part of Almighty don't we understand? I think it would have been okay as soon as Jacob heard his father say, God Almighty bless you. He could have said, Dad, I'm good. That's all I need to hear. 
God Almighty is with me. What more could we possibly need than that? Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of Jim Elliot, who was the missionary that lost his life bringing the gospel to the Huarani Indians of Ecuador, wrote a book about her husband's life. And of all the titles that she could have chosen for this book, how her husband had gone down with a group of men to, to witness to be the first missionaries to this group of Indians, and they had all been killed by the tribe. And eventually they had sent additional people down and the Indians had come to know Jesus Christ. And Elizabeth captures this whole story and you think about all the titles she could have used and the title that she uses is in the shadow of the Almighty. She called her book Shadow of the Almighty from Psalm 91.1 because she was utterly convinced that the refuge of the people of God is not a refuge from suffering and death. It's not a refuge from that. But it's a refuge from final and ultimate defeat. He who saves his life, Jesus said, will lose it. But he who loses his life for the sake of the gospel will save it. Because the Lord is God Almighty. That psalm says in Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, the shadow of God Almighty, will abide in the shadow of Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And so Jacob sets out on his journey, the blessing of his father, but more importantly, with the blessing of God Almighty. Verse 6, Now Esau says, saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there, that he blessed him, and as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite woman, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Paddan Aram, And so when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahaloth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. So again we see poor Esau, Jacob's brother. And again he's in the shadow of Jacob. He's not using his spiritual eyes, he's using his fleshly eyes. He sees Isaac sending Jacob away because his father didn't want him marrying any of the Canaanite women that they were living amongst. But remember, Esau had already married two Canaanite women of the Hittites. And remember, it had brought bitterness to his parents, to Isaac and Rebekah. And so what does he decide to do after seeing what just happened between Isaac and Jacob, how he'd sent him off? He takes off and goes to Isaac's brother, Ishmael. And he decides to marry one of his daughters, Mahaloth. And so Mahaloth isn't a Canaanite, true, but she is the granddaughter of Hagar, the outcast Egyptian servant of Sarah, who had taken an Egyptian wife for her son, Esau. So if Esau's goal was to improve his parents' approval rating of his wives, he kind of whiffed on this one, didn't he? He was looking through his fleshly eyes, and he had seen how Isaac had sent Jacob away to get a non-Canaanite woman, but he didn't follow in similar steps. He goes off to Ishmael and ends up marrying a woman, really, of Egyptian descent. Verse 10, it says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. 
And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob, remember Jacob? We described who Jacob was. Jacob was the homeboy. Not that kind of homeboy. He was a a boy of the home. He wasn't an outdoorsman. He hung around with mom and helped in the kitchen. And now he's some 300 miles away from home, fleeing his angry brother and facing an unknown future. And all he had to depend on in his mind at that time was his father's blessing. And from now on, the homeboy would have to become a pilgrim and walk by faith. It was a three-day journey from where he had left to where he was then, which was then known as Luz. And those first three days of his adventure must have been very difficult for him. Probably the first time he had been away from home and away from his family. Questions are probably in his mind. Hey, is Esau going to come after me? Follow me and try to kill me? Am I going to have enough food for the journey? Never been this far away from home before. And so as the sun is going down in this little area where he had camped out for the night, they arrive at this particular spot. Jacob gets a nice comfortable stone for a pillow. Anyone ever done that? Can you picture yourself doing that? I have a hard time sleeping on a regular pillow. I can imagine sleeping on a stone. But Jacob here, we've got to give him some camping cred. The brother's sleeping on a rock for a pillow. And guess what? While he's sleeping on a rock, he happens to have a strange dream. Go figure. But check out the dream. This is the real deal. Verse 12, it says, And he dreamed, and behold, there was this ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So God allows Jacob to have this crazy dream, this vision, really. There's this ladder or staircase that goes from the earth all the way up to heaven. And on this stairway to heaven, so to speak, Jacob sees angels going up and down. Ascending and descending from heaven and earth. And if that isn't enough, he then sees something else. He sees the Lord at the top of the staircase, Yahweh. And the Lord reveals himself to Jacob for the first time. It's the first time that he reveals himself to Jacob. And he calls himself Yahweh, the great I Am. The personal name of God. I'm sure Jacob had definitely had encounters where he had heard about this God from his father and perhaps from his grandfather and how they had had personal encounters with the creator of the universe. But on this particular night, as he had stepped out on his own and taking this stone for a pillow, he's away from his mom and his dad. The Lord appears to him personally at the top of this stairway. 
And the Lord reconfirms the covenant. The covenant that he had made both with his grandfather Abraham and with his father Isaac. That Jacob and his descendants would inherit this land where he was now lying. That his offspring would be as the dust of the earth. That through them, all of the families of the earth would be blessed. And that he would be with Jacob wherever he went and would keep him and bring him back to this land. What a cool dream to have. But the Lord does more than give our friend Jacob here a comforting dream. Confirming the covenant that he had made with Abraham and Isaac and promising to be with them, that's amazing enough in itself. But what about this stairway? With these angels that are ascending and descending on it. What is all that all about? In Jacob's dream, he's shown that there was access to heaven. Jacob now knew God was closer than ever and that there was real access and interaction between heaven and earth. God allows Jacob to peek behind the curtain of the spiritual world, if but for one night. He finds that there are things going on all around him that he was not even remotely aware of. And more importantly, If you could turn to John chapter 1, verse 47. More importantly, God also gives Jacob a glimpse into the truth that there would come complete access to heaven from earth. John chapter 1, verse 47. It says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit or no guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Read that last verse again. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God Ascending and descending on what? On the Son of Man. Jesus made it clear in verse 51 of John chapter 1 that He is the access to heaven. He is the means by which heaven comes down to us and by which we can go to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. He does not show us a way. He is the way. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me in John chapter 14. I am the way, he said. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, it says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Christ. Jesus. So in this dream, in this vision that Jacob had, God only not only gives him confirmation that the covenant promises have now passed on to him, but he also gives Jacob, who would later be called Israel, a revelation of the atoning work of the Messiah to come. God lays the framework here in Genesis chapter 8 that Jesus would later refer to in the words that are captured in the first chapter of John. This is what he was talking about. When he mentions the angels ascending and descending. 
And I can imagine when Paul was hearing this story about what Jesus had said to Nathanael and how it so clearly echoed back to this very night in Jacob's life when he read about that and he put two and two together, it completely blew his mind. This vision that is given to Jacob while his head rested upon the rock and the words of the Lord from the top of the stairway, they capture the essence of both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And then Jacob wakes up from this whole thing. It's crazy. And he's still kind of a newbie in following the Lord, right? He's still learning. He's just had his first encounter with God. Verse 16, it says, And then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Whoa, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob thinks he's stumbled across the geographic house of God and the geographic gate of heaven there. But the Lord is just starting to introduce himself to Jacob. He had had just the first of six direct encounters with the God of heaven and earth. And he's starting his journey with the Lord and we'll, he will be learning all about his ways and his love just as we do every day as we are on our journey with him. And so we read in verse 18, it says, So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil out on the top of it. So Jacob takes that stone that he had used for a pillow. This stone now had some significant meaning for him, didn't it? It represents an amazing moment in his life. And so what is his next act? His next act was to worship the God who had appeared to him. He turned the stone into a pillar to memorialize the great experience that had been his that night. And by pouring oil on that stone, he consecrated it to the Lord. He set it apart. He didn't use the stone as an altar. He didn't make a sacrifice on it. He simply set it apart as a memorial, as a way to remember what the Lord had done for him. But most important, Jacob dedicated himself to the Lord that morning. It's great to have a rock and a memorial and he pours oil on it. That's all great. But the most important thing is Jacob dedicated himself to the Lord that morning and claimed the promises that God had made to him. Since God had promised to care for him, be with him, bring him back home safely, then Jacob would affirm his faith in God and would seek to worship and honor him alone. Verse 19, it says, He called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. What does Bethel mean? House of God, Bethel. The city of Bethel would play an important, though not glorious, role in Israel's history. Among the cities of Israel, it is second only to Jerusalem in the number of times it's mentioned in the Old Testament. Later in Genesis chapter 31, we'll read about when he's speaking to Jacob, God referred to himself as the God of Bethel. Verse 20, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I can come again to my father's house in peace, and the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So up until now, 
God had been the only one making vows or covenants. We didn't hear any of that going on from Abraham or Isaac of making a covenant or a vow to God. But Jacob's experience that night with his head laying on this rock would change him forever. He had experienced the Lord, and that experience had left a mark on him. He was so undone by what had happened that he was prompted to make a vow to the Lord. That was his response after that night. The theologian Albert Barnes wrote, Abraham had responded to the call of God, believed in the Lord. This is Abraham. He responded to the call of God. He believed in the Lord. He walked before him. He entered into communion with him. He made intercession with him and given up his only son to him at his demand. In all this, there is an acceptance on the part of the creature of the supremacy of the merciful creator. But now the spirit of adoption prompts Jacob to a spontaneous movement towards God. In Abraham, we saw acceptance on the part of the creature, on the creature toward his creator. But now the spirit of adoption prompts Jacob to a spontaneous movement towards God. He wants to make a vow towards God. That's how excited and and passionate he is in his response toward what God had done. God made the first move towards Jacob, as he does with all of us. And this is Jacob's way of saying, yes. If you will be with me and keep me in the way that I go, then you shall be my God. Jacob does business with God right here in the house of God in the middle of nowhere. And because God is in the house, nowhere becomes somewhere. It becomes a place that Jacob will never forget. And that place changes forever. The place previously known as Luz becomes Bethel house of God. And it's amazing how many times in Scripture when God does His work, it is so wonderful, that work is so wonderful that names have to change. Whether it's places or people. The names just can't remain the same. It's, it's just not even right. Names have to change. God here holds out his hand to Jacob, and Jacob grabs it with gusto. He's by no means perfect. He's flawed, and he's a sinner, just as we all are. But he decides at this point in time to be all in with God. By saying, then the Lord shall be my God, Jacob hands over the reins of his life to the Lord. We referenced earlier what Jesus said to Nathanael in John chapter 1. But earlier on in that chapter, in in verses 12 and 13 of John chapter 1, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. Jacob had done nothing to deserve this, had he? In fact, just the opposite. He'd been a lying and deceiving son and brother. What what Jacob got to experience here in Bethel, was the awesomeness of the grace of God, didn't he? Despite whatever he had done that we've all read about, all the deceiving and lying and all that stuff that was going on in the last chapter, despite all that, God still reaches out his hand to him in grace. And all Jacob had to do was reach up and take that hand. 
Jacob got to experience here in Bethel the awesomeness of the grace of God, the unmerited favor and undeserved affection. And this morning, as we close, I think the biggest takeaway from this chapter is Jacob's response to this. I think that's the biggest takeaway from all of this is his response. He's completely overwhelmed by the magnitude of what he had just experienced on that rock. And Jacob had a worship service right there. with nothing but a rock and some oil. He knew that he wasn't worthy. He knew that he wasn't deserving. And the response to the grace that had been extended to him is so cool to read about, so cool to see. In that moment, he wasn't overwhelmed by some architecture of some church or cathedral. He wasn't blown away by a worship team with effects or light shows. He wasn't drawn in by the worship experience that had been created or the sheer number of people that had come to watch the show. He was captured by the love of God and the fact that the one who had set the stars in the heavens and filled the earth with life was also the one who loved him enough to reach out to him and offer him a way. A way up that stairway that bridged the gap between heaven and earth and into the arms of God Almighty, El Shaddai. The one who had created him in the first place and the one who had a plan and a purpose for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an amazing story we have just read. And Lord, as we have gathered here this morning, I pray that we too would be changed having been in your presence, just like Jacob was. Jacob was changed. The the name of the town was changed. Nothing was the same as a result of that encounter. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we have encountered you, that we would be changed as well. Nothing would be the same. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not yet responded to that grace, despite whatever may have been done in the past, I pray that they would say yes now. As you reach down your hand and ask them to trust in you as Savior and God Almighty, I pray that they would in their heart this morning just say yes and consent to be loved, and start their journey following you. So Lord, I pray that regardless of our surroundings, the external physical things that, whether we're at home or out driving in the road or in this building, Lord, we would experience the awesomeness of your grace and that our response would be just an outpouring of thankfulness and amazement. So Lord, just bless us now and keep us and guide us on that journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen.